We are now live. Welcome to this edition of Civic Engagement and Leadership Development here at CUNY School of Labor and Urban Studies. I'm Alethea Jones, Distinguished Lecturer and Director of CELD. Today's March 18th edition of the Battle for Democracy, Voting Rights, Labor, and Electoral Power will feature Georgia. And we will examine how and why the political tides are turning in Georgia. Yesterday, I joined a conversation about rising authoritarianism in the United States and the role of unions in combating it. And it's clear that winning individual elections one by one, cycle by cycle is important, but it's not enough to address the crisis that is upon us. To some, this crisis appears new, bursting onto the scene on January 6th, 2021. Uh, but for many of us, this is the latest chapter in a long running anti-democratic playbook. The truth is that racist authoritarianism has long defined the United States. This is not new news. We have long experience fighting this brand of terror in all of its forms. They say, as the South goes, so goes the nation. Georgia is the beating heart of the South. It is both the site of violent repression as well as a place of principled resistance and moral authority. We are joined today by two of the leading strategists and architects of a political rebirth in Georgia, the South, the nation, and dare I say the globe. I am pleased to welcome John Taylor, director of SEIU's Unified Governing Campaign. He is based in Atlanta, Georgia, and Ense Ufot, former president of the New Georgia Project, which she co-founded with uh, Stacey Abrams. Jerry Hudson is unable to join us today. Welcome. Before we jump into uh, the burning issues of the day, tell us a bit more about yourselves. What is your current organization and role and where does it fit in the electoral ecosystem? John. I can start, but I like to defer to Insay. That, that's my, my <laughs> Go ahead, John. I, I, I was going alphabetically, me. but we can defer to Insay, of course. I, you know, I, I just support the leadership emphatically of Black women, especially when they're <laughs> Insay, so I'm just happy to be uh, in the space. Oh, uh, well, thank you. <laughs> Good morning. <laughs> Good morning. Uh, but yeah, so I am... Um, John Taylor, he trilogy pronouns for, for folks who use the pronouns. I currently am the Unified Governing Campaign Director for SEIU, which is a fancy way to say I'm a traffic cop between uh, federal strategy work, reconciliation work, and figuring out how we mobilize, not just within our silos, but how we bring voting rights, how we bring immigration, how we bring climate justice, how we bring social justice and labor organizing uh, under a lens of race uh, and the economy uh, in a smart way that allows us to build power unilaterally across the board. So that's my day job. And then I also have the pleasure of being one of the co-founders of Black Male Initiative Georgia, which is this amazing kind of like base building organization here on the ground here. Uh, in Georgia that's focused on civic engagement, criminal justice reform, economic enfranchisement, Black mental health and wellness, and education. So those are our five pillars. I love this. Um, uh, good morning, everyone. And I'm Say Ufat. Uh, and up until um, a few months ago now, uh, I ran an organization, actually a suite of organizations um, under the umbrella of the New Georgia Project. Um, you can think about it as a, like, there's a C3 to C4. And then um, New South Super PAC, uh, which is um, doing really incredible and important innovative work around um, mobilizing and electing progressives in the 11 states of the former Confederacy. So that work spans from uh, Texas over to the DMV. And 
uh, yeah, I, I'm a long-term organizer. Uh, and now that I'm no longer running the day-to-day -day of an organization, I um, am in the very beginning of book leave, uh, where I have the sort of benefit of taking a step back uh, to not only sort of evaluate uh, the organizing that we've done in Georgia over the past decade, uh, but to sort of really evaluate where we are in this moment, sort of in the long uh, arc of the moral universe, um, and really understanding um, how we get uh, to the next sort of iteration, how we train the next generation of leaders, how we're thinking about the big fights that are happening now, uh, and what's brewing and what's on the horizon. Well, I think before we launch into all of that, maybe we could get to know you a bit better by finding about how you got trained in the new generation of leaders. So take us back a bit to either your first job in politics or that first assignment where you had a big aha moment that, yeah, this is, this is the life for me. This is where I wanna to contribute to social change. I mean, I don't, my first job where I got paid doesn't feel like the beginning of my uh, electoral and, and organizing journey. I'm going to say, so I'm, I'm an immigrant. I was born in Nigeria and uh, this will not be unfamiliar to a lot of folks, but, you know, in addition to being a graduate student, my dad also was a taxi driver. Um, and so... <laughs> Uh, spending a lot of time with uh, taxi drivers down in what they call the bullpen um, in the Atlanta airport, which is where they sort of hang around and wait until um, fares uh, come. And to, it was there that there was sort of always a political consciousness, even amongst these working class immigrants, um, that there not only did that, that there they always have an analysis about what was going on in the US political context, but they always kept an eye on the politics as like they were developing in their countries of origin. And so being in the bullpen, like eating jollof rice from some auntie <laughs> uh, that was a vendor and sitting at the feet of my father and a bunch of uncles and really understanding, um, beginning to understand an analysis about decision makers and power and people power and how it relates to money. Um, and, you know, I... Uh, washed windshields uh, and I went and got people Coke and water uh, and I was paid like with loose change and political analysis. So my first job job uh, was working in the legal department with uh, AFSCME Ohio Council 8. Uh, after I left corporate law uh, and decided that like this was like people power working with a, a, a powerful institution to think about how to win uh, for my community, win for myself and my family. Um, but I was you know deep into my 20s then. That's really beautiful. Thank you for sharing both aspects of that. And my dad is, was also a taxi driver. And is now a, a private chauffeur. So it's, it's a lovely start. And so you just um, took me back to the bullpen in Atlanta, <laughs> like organizing with Reverend Orange, like that brown toothfish with them vendors. Yes. Yo, uh -huh. <laughs> Changed my life. That was beautiful. Um, <clears throat> so I, I come from Cleveland, Ohio originally. And, and so my first job that actually politicized me, uh, I, I was 10 or 11 years old and I was cleaning out houses with my landlord. And so essentially I was learning how to uh, gut uh, Section 8 houses that had been dilapidated or not well cared for. And there were just all of these conversations because, you know, I'm, I'm six foot four. 320 pounds now then I was six foot one as an 11 year old I was I was I was a grown size man at 11 right and so 
um, I was doing hard labor over the summer with a crew of men that were formerly uh, incarcerated. They were returning citizens, uh, returning uh, citizens. They had uh, drug abuse problems, alcoholism, um, family uh, issues. Like we, folks were trying to survive. As the streets of Cleveland is rough, right? And so as a 10 year old, 11 year old kind of hanging out with the, those grown men uh, and listening to their stories and hearing every day while we were ripping out drywall and removing baseboards and tossing couches out of broken windows, uh, you, you really begin to understand like what it means to be rough uh, in a community that is so overrun with gentrification because Cleveland at the time was a powder keg um and so that was really my first job that paid me money uh over the summer <clears throat> and then fast forward to uh being able to take that information and process it i was playing football and i was a junior in high school uh, at john adams and during that time period one of my friends got out of school um he had been in juvenile uh, custody. He came home. He went to study hall. A couple of folks made fun of him. He pulled out a gun. He chased them out of the school. He shot one of them in front of the school. He shot the other one uh, about two blocks down the street. Uh, and he sparked a kind of movement in Cleveland uh, that led to us kind of protesting we found out that the principal had been trying to shut down the school. We found out that he was calling us animals, criminals, like we didn't deserve a school. Uh, and ultimately, my 11th grade year, they actually shut down my school. <clears throat> and I went from John Adams High School, a place where I was essentially um, held or detained all day. We had uh, metal detectors in the building. There were armed guards outside, off-duty and on-duty police officers, fights every day. And I went, when they shut down John Adams, I went to a school called Shaker Heights High School. And Shaker Heights, for those folks who don't know, was the third richest community in the country at the time. The, uh, the uh, uh, coach for the New York Jets lived there. There were like a bunch of Fortune 500 company, uh, Fortune 500 company executives that lived in the community. But it was really only a 15 minute bus ride from my house uh, in inner city Cleveland off 128th and Kinsman. But when I went to Shaker Heights, they had a planetarium in the school and there were no, there were, there were no, <clears throat> there were no metal detectors and there were no police and the whole campus smelled like marijuana and it was a campus and kids were allowed to come and go as they pleased with no kind of controls. <clears throat> and, and I think that was the first time I saw a stark difference between kind of the classism that existed and the controls that existed in my inner city life and the freedom that people who lived 15 minutes away from me uh, had the opportunity to enjoy. And so when I took the experiences of my 11 year old self cleaning out houses that summer and making, you know, money doing it, and I applied that to what I saw folks in shake because they were not cleaning out houses. They, that was not what they did during the summer it kind of catalyzed something in me. Sorry if that was along with it. What is so clear from both of you is how deeply um, embodied <laughs> these experiences are, that um, also how deeply rooted in community and relationships. And that we're never too young because <laughs> everything is happening around us. And that political awakening uh, can happen before we're even teenagers. There's something about the society we live in, <laughs> not just our families, but our communities and the societies that we see these lines of division and opportunity from a very, very young age. Thank you for sharing the stories, those early stories with us. We have so many burning questions about Georgia, like what a special opportunity 
this is to celebrate you and all of your colleagues and what's been created in over a decade um, in Georgia. So let's get to it and let's start with the good news, as they say. <laughs> The good news, take us behind the scenes around um, Senator Warnock and, and that, that win, which we're so, so grateful for. Yeah, I mean, I think that, you know, they're, they're, the untold story um, about the Warnock and quite frankly, the awesome victories as well um, is the like deep, long, um, commitment to sort of building the multiracial democracy um, and not for its own purposes, right? Uh, but there were things that the folks in our coalitions and in these organizations, there are actual material things that folks seek, are seeking to win uh, for their members and their families, right? And so, you know, <clears throat> We have been making the case for quite some time um, that uh, there needed to be an investment in the infrastructure, the base building and community organizing, um, the uh, legacy civil rights and labor infrastructure. Um, you know, so basically across movement traditions and legacies. Um, in order to meet this demographic shift that we were all witnessing happening in the country for sure, but definitely happening in Georgia. Um, you know, a lot has been written about 2050 um, and that being the date where the country becomes majority people of color, that date is like 2025 in Georgia, right? And so, but with that said, um, we were all clear leaders across traditions that demographics do not automatically equal destiny, right? That we are talking about, um, you know, just because Georgia is prepped to be the first state in the deep South with a white minority, does it mean that we were going to overcome uh, 20 years of unified Republican control in every Every branch of government and that we would have automatically uh, elected officials and a policy and a political environment that would support the ambitions that we had for our organizing and our families. And so we started, you know, sharing plans, uh, dreaming together. Um, you know, there were several tables constructed uh, for the different types of organizations and how they play together. Uh, but, you know, we're in the middle of a pandemic uh, and there was clarity in 2020 that essentially our government, our state government and our federal government had abandoned us and that, um, you know, there were echoes of the 1919 pandemic and mutual aid and, um, you know, popular education and political education that were happening in different social circles, faith leaders stepping up in this moment to, you know, to make the moral case uh, for why we needed our government to step up for us. And so, there was a 2020 presidential election. Um, you know, there was the historic map uh, and the pathways to victory that people had in their minds. Uh, and, uh, you know, there wasn't a belief again that Georgia was competitive, that, you know, there were red states and blue states and a handful of battleground states and Georgia wasn't considered one of them. Um, I mean, fast forward, uh, Georgians elected um, President Biden and Vice President Harris. Uh, and then nine weeks later, uh, there was a runoff and it was a, a big deal because it was for control of the United States Senate. Um, and so again, given how uh, traditional presidential campaigns and particularly democratic campaigns that are focused on mobilizing voters of color, uh, no one on this call will be surprised about the perpetual challenges of late money. No one will be uh, surprised by the challenges that are presented when, you know, the dominant political parties think that Black voters are just a mobilization universe. And so they don't need persuasion and you don't have to start talking to people until Labor Day, if not Halloween, uh, during an election cycle. And the truth of the matter is that um, it was because 
because there was existing infrastructure uh, that we were having high quality face-to-face -face conversations when possible with millions of Georgians of color. By that time we had registered at the New Georgia Project, half a million new voters of color in all 159 of Georgia's counties. You know, so there were um, labor and uh, community organizations and um, you know, immigrant rights and RJ organizations and everyone sort of holding down their pieces and um, connecting the power of the vote with the things that they are organizing for on a day-to-day -day basis. And so while the rest of the country was scrambling to think about like what to do over the nine, one, nine weeks and how they could uh, turn out uh, the vote again, Georgia organizers were ready. Uh, and that's exactly what we did. And so, you know, because of that, um, we were able to elect a 33 year old Jewish kid from the North Atlanta suburbs, you know, at a time where the majority of the Senate was born before there were even 50 states. Right. Um, and then, uh, uh, you know, Georgia's first African American United States Senator and Reverend Warnock, uh, who, you know, when you think about uh, Ebenezer Baptist Church, there was Martin Luther King, two other dudes, and Warnock. Uh, and so, like, carrying on that legacy um, of America's Civil Rights Church is actually pretty meaningful um, nationally and meaningful in Atlanta. And we needed to make meaning of it throughout the rest of Georgia, in rural Georgia, and uh, places. Um, that again, where our voters were that weren't getting talked to directly by campaigns. And so I think it's a story about um, organizing. I think it's a story about elections not being the end all be all, but that they are opportunities for us to test the power that we're building and opportunities for us to flex the power that we're building over the long term. Woof. You know, for folks to really appreciate, right, the 10 year building of that, there are no overnight success stories. They just appear to be so. Yeah. Um, and so the development of uh, this really, really incredible machine is quite something. John, I wonder if you could illuminate, you know, what's the role of labor? in all of this, right, in the construction of this alternative politics, this alternative machine, and how does labor balance that role against um, its longstanding relationship with the mainstream Democratic Party? Absolutely. Uh, I, I think there's a couple of things. Like when, when I hear 10 years, uh, my heart screams add 20 years to it, right? And so th this is where we talk, you know, add another 20 years to that. This is where we talk about the influx and in the, in the value of labor. Uh, when we think about the base building that existed before grassroots community organizations had the infrastructure, if we think about which institutions helped to fuel the initial groundbreaking work of those organizations, labor is top of that list. Those large progressive unions that either were public sector or private uh, sector unions because they understood the value in terraforming uh, the political landscape and doing some geographical density or market-based analysis of how we grow power, whether it was through uh, city council races or mayors, uh, small municipalities and school boards, going after governor seats, moving strategically behind closed doors. I think labor has been critical to uh, creating the baseline for the infrastructure that these grassroots independent expenditure uh, non-governmental organizations were able to lift up when you look at the work of reverend orange over a 50 plus year span of time coming out of the civil rights movement being the community political organizer for the afl-cio targeting those southern regional campaigns and strategies to drive growth being able to funnel resource into communities that otherwise would not have had the dollars to undergird and stabilize the sheer magnitude of the movement. 
And then the last thing I'll just say about labor specifically is that labor is a place where you can try and fail and innovate and grow. And there's not the same criticism because we have that balanced relationship with, with uh, the big democratic organizations or the big political organizations. We, we often function on multiple levels. So there's a face of labor that is absolutely sitting at the DNC and having those conversations and moving at the highest level. But then there's a face of labor that is absolutely entrenched with members on the ground. They are part of the churches. They are part of the community orgs. They are in the social clubs. And so we get to see across a spectrum of identity how the politic plays out. And so I think that's critical to understand about labor. The other thing that's critical to understand about labor is that labor is not a monolith. We are not all progressive and all knowing and there. Like we, we are in a tug of war, even amongst ourselves, about how progressive, how forward thinking, how much we, you know, break through versus how much we retrench and hold tight and just weather the storm. Uh, and I think that is the that is the balancing measure of labor. That as good as it can be, it can also be a detractor from growth because it is not always as innovative and visionary as it could be. It is not always as willing to take the risk because when you're in labor, it's not about you. It's about your members. It's not about kind of, what your personal politic is or where you align, it's an organizational identity, which I do think is different from the grassroots organizations, which are lifting up and carrying a different kind of connection directly to the ground, right? Uh, and then, you know, I'll say, there's just this moment where, like when I hear in say, say specifically, you know, Georgia organizers, and I hear her say, you know, we make meaning of a moment or we make meaning of the ability to drive work. That matters so much to me in the context of labor, because there have been many times when what labor would have done was fly in a few hundred or a few thousand organizers and say, we're going to run this part of the campaign or we're going to do this work. But it was because of the leadership and the vision and the, and the pushback of folks like Insight that we didn't have that scenario. Yes, there were folks who flew in, who drove in, who committed months of their lives to support and help. But what was even more important was this conversation about resourcing the organizations on the ground and not thinking that we would come in somehow and magically save Georgia because Georgia actually didn't need to be saved. The base building organizations in Georgia needed to be resourced and then when we did that properly, Georgia saved America, right? So, and maybe democracy around the globe. And so it, it, it's that shift in thinking over the last, that's why I say 30 years or 40 years, where people begin to understand that the South has something to say and that we have the responsibility, we have the agency, and we have the skill, knowledge, and the ability to make meaning of our moments and to telegraph that to the world. So you don't have to come in to save us, but you do have to work your tail off and help us uh, because it is all of our responsibility. But how that shows up now is different. And I think we take that forward into the innovation, into the work when we think about M4BL, other networks, other partners, other allies in the space and how labor begins to reimagine itself in this moment. <laughs> I love that deep grounding <laughs> in three decades, right, or more. And I especially love that this point on you need to resource us for the long term has shifted from an idea <laughs> that's made in a conversation to something that has an infrastructure and institutions behind it. Right, like how do you make this real? And that um, you all have helped to build that. And that the on the ground innovative part of labor also helped to make that possible. And that labor could retool itself in Georgia and hopefully elsewhere, right? So it's really demonstrating 
um, that this is possible. Can you shed some light on uh, the one of the biggest disappointments of the last electoral cycle, which is not winning the governorship of, of Georgia? So yeah, explain for us how we won the Senate, but not, not the governorship. I'm gonna kick it to John first and let, we're gonna get the mature <laughs> answer. <laughs> Uh, and then I'm just gonna come up with that. Ta, 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 ta. <laughs> you see how my leader tells me how we supposed to behave? Because <laughs> I really want to say we didn't lose in eighteen. We won. That's number one. But we, we, we I, I won't be petty. Okay? I'll be clear about the fact that yeah. what was stolen isn't the same as what was lost, right? And we have to understand. And I know NSA is gonna go here, but. When we talk about the erosion of civil liberties, rights, democracy, voting rights acts, our ability to do work, our ability to show up, how we mobilize people on the ground so that they can effectively have their voices heard, and we see the complete collapse and erosion of that structure between 2018 and 2022, it tells me that whoever is behind the wheel is wayward. They are not, they, they do not care about the folks in the car. And more importantly, there is no real destination. They just want to control the wheel. They just want power for power's sake at all costs. When I think about Senate Bill 202, when I think about that Frankenstein legislation that was signed in the governor's chamber, surrounded by six white men, when I think about the fact that a black woman got arrested for knocking on a door, she was a legislator, Representative Park Cannon got arrested in Georgia for knocking on the governor's door to ask, what are you doing behind closed doors in your chambers that you cannot do in the rotunda under the eyes of the Georgia citizens that you were supposed to represent? And she was arrested, manhandled. So when we talk about the devastation of the loss of the governorship, it is a double devastation. It's not just the loss of the governorship, which is devastating in and of itself to have something stolen and then to fight against it and steal it, oh my God. But it is, it is the sheer magnitude of the foolishness, of the cynicism, of the rise of fascism that is, in my opinion, taking over. And, you know, I define fascism as the ability to use military political controls that are held by a dictator or one person that advance a certain race or gender above others, that drive a narrative that somehow we're going to make America great again and we'll be all better for it. But don't think for a second that we don't remember what your folks were during those times when I thought or they thought America was great. This is what we mean by the disturbing trend and the problem with the governor's race of 22. First of all, I can't really say how disappointed I am in 22 without saying that the, the guy that was the secretary of state ran for governor in 2018, did not vacate his seat while he was running for governor in an election where the seat he was in governed the outcome of the election. If that doesn't just feel wrong, I don't know what does. This is a moment when, when, the, when the United States goes to other countries under the auspices of the United Nations and we govern election. When we assert that we are a moral democracy and that we want to assure that the electoral politics around the world are not hamstrung by dictators, but at home, we allow these types of ridiculous political games to be played. I seriously question the validity of our structure. I'm gonna pause there. I mean, you know, here's what I'll say. 
um, that there are lessons um, in the Georgia gubernatorial race um, in 2018 and 2022 um, that are really instructive uh, for uh, you know, uh, future elections um, and particularly future national elections and how advocates um, and organizers and operatives and ordinary Americans should be thinking about it in this moment. Number one, I think that um, disinformation and misinformation as a tool um, that we used to joke that like, you know, was it the Russians or the Republicans? I think that people think about it just as a tool between nation states, uh, these sort of Cold War tactics, but we are seeing them deployed in municipal elections, state elections, and absolutely in federal elections. And our campaigns are not equipped and our government doesn't appear to be equipped to help combat and neutralize the impact of disinformation. And it's deeply concerning. The wells of information that ordinary Americans are going to for information about their government and information about um, upcoming elections are intentionally being poisoned. I think about the rhetoric around, or no, the hand-wringing and the worrying about Black men's participation in the 22 elections, um, that there was a concern, well, there was mis disinformation about the fact that, um, that Black male support for Trump went up between 2016 and 2020, and there that was not true, that when the 50 state canvas was done, we saw that Black male voter support for Trump actually went down between 2016 and 2020. Um, but that disinfo was used to pepper a lot of public conversations and make awful predictions and give a bunch of hot takes about how black men didn't support Stacey, that black men were growing conservative in their voting behavior um, and that they were an unreliable part of the uh, progressive voting bloc, which then made black male leaders feel like they needed to defend themselves, defend the work that they're doing the whole time they're doing the work. And again, we saw historic levels of participation from black male voters. We saw Stacey get almost 90% of support from black male voters in Georgia. Again, time, energy, hand wringing, um, public narratives and public conversations based completely in a lie. One, two, another example, um, the, the predictions of the red wave, right? That Republicans consistently flooded the zone with trash polls. And because the press was insistent on covering the horse race, as opposed to covering the substance of these candidates and their positions and doing the public service that one used to expect from journalists, right? To make meaning, to make sense of these candidates and what where they stand, um, that that had been abandoned for covering the horse race. And one party was intentionally flooding the media landscape with trash, with polls that they knew were not accurate representations of what was actually happening. Um, and so how we use polling, how we understand polling and the role of polling and research um, is going to be super instructive moving forward. Where do young people go? Where do new Americans go? Where do voters go to evaluate candidates against one another outside of, uh, again, the horse race? And so big um, questions about false information. It, and again, it goes down to the municipal uh, elections in 2021. There was a race for uh, mayor of Atlanta and there was a black woman, um, city council person named Felicia Moore running against a black man, Andre Dickens, also serving on Atlanta city council. Um, and when people were finding it super difficult to evaluate the candidates on the substance, we saw a disinfo campaign emerge that said that Felicia Moore as a city council person in Atlanta 
wanted to shut down all nightclubs. Now, for anyone that knows Atlanta, you know how important nightlife is as a part of the culture uh, and particularly like youth culture and the entertainment and music industry. Um, and so the idea that there was this black woman leader who had a reputation for trying to shut down clubs or voting, to put, advancing a vote to shut down all nightclubs in Atlanta um, would be pretty harmful um, in a mayor's race. The problem is that there was never a record of the vote. There's never a record of any speeches. There were these um, rappers and influencers who supported her opponent who were a part of advancing this lie. And then it wasn't until after the election where the, the mayor said, I've served with Felicia Moore for years on Atlanta City Council. She never voted to shut down clubs, right? And so this info, again, it's not just the Russians, it's not just the Republicans, it's not just the Chinese government and nation states against one another um, that we're seeing it play out over and over again. And that's the danger of not learning those lessons from the Georgia governor's race and really taking it seriously. I think that the second thing is that there we are getting more and more comfortable with public bad behavior from elected officials. Um, that breaking of norms, the violation of the law, um, and that like the outrage button, I think is broken in many of our brains because of overuse and overstimulation and that we are continuing to be outraged and we're continuing to see that, <clears throat> again, norm violating, norm breaking, unconstitutional, unconscious, immoral, just awful behavior from leaders. Um, we... <laughs> And it's a problem. Herschel Walker is arguably the worst candidate uh, to run for anything in Georgia history. And the idea that we were supposed to just ignore the wild things that were said by him and his supporters, uh, and then like search through the poop for the corn kernel that had some sort of nutrients that we were trying to digest as voters is ridiculous. Um, and again, we were encouraged to not talk about it and that we were constantly being assaulted by this offensive behavior and offensive rhetoric. I look at Governor Ron DeSantis, I look at Kerry Lake in Arizona, and these folks are wild and are easy, like any day of the week, anything that they say and do disqualifies them from public leadership. And yet, like we are supposed to treat them as if they are statesmen, as if they are working in the interest of voters. Um, and I think that young people, um, for the first time, I'm deeply concerned. I think that we're, um, that with this bad behavior that is publicly being excused and it appears as if like we can't hold these bad leaders accountable either through the criminal legal system right like the former disgraced former president of the united states continuing to taunt folks about not being uh arrested despite the fact that he's violated several laws uh, <clears throat> we're talking about you know um this rogue Supreme Court bending over backwards uh, to eradicate 49 years of legal precedence around uh, privacy and bodily autonomy, right? And then as we think about moving forward, um, we're headed, my first election, full disclosure, was the 2000 presidential election. And I watched the Supreme Court stopped counting Black people's votes in South Florida, hanging chads and pregnant nipples and Katherine Harris as the Secretary of State of Florida and Governor uh, Jeb Bush, like essentially arranging the election for his brother who was a candidate with along with the Supreme Court. Now you take this Supreme Court, Right. And then you put a contested election before them in 2024, not to mention Moore versus Harper, which is a Supreme Court case that is going to be decided any day now um, that will do it. Uh, will deal a, a grievous blow uh, to the Voting Rights Act. Right. That these are questions that these are um, tactics that we saw at play in the Georgia gubernatorial election that have been effective uh, and that 
are going to get amplified in national elections that are going to have larger consequences that Americans do not want, right? I think that um, the flood of money uh, and the impact that it had on ad buys on what people saw, I think is really important. I think that, um, you know, national interest in the outcome of the Senate elections had a strategy that diverged from ours, that there was a belief that you could invest in turning out moderate Republicans because Herschel Walker was such a, a detestable candidate that by turning out Republicans and encouraging them to vote for Warnock, that it would ultimately get the impact that uh, folks were looking for. The problem is, is that Republicans, at least in Georgia, vote for Republicans or they don't vote. Right. And so it is quite possible that you are turning out Camp Warnock voters. In fact, we will very soon have data that shows that that's what happened. Right. And so what should have been an outright victory against the worst candidate in the history of Georgia elections and arguably like one of the best profiles uh, in national elections and national politics right now ended up in a runoff where he still almost lost. Uh, because, and again, it was Black voters and progressives and young voters, um, but particularly Black male and Black female voters that turned out in historic numbers that dragged a Warnock victory because of this amplified uh, participation um, with Georgia Republicans, even though Herschel Walker was a candidate that they were not excited about. Um, so there's a lot happening in Georgia. I think that we are not the only ones that are thinking about innovation and experimentation and how to take what is working um, and amplify it. And um, those are my lessons uh, from the Georgia gubernatorial race. Oof. Oof. That feels like so deep and the dissertation right on so many, so many lessons there. Um, you know, a colleague of mine at Brooklyn College put it very well earlier this week. She said time and again, the votes of black women, in this case, the black community save democracy. And we don't necessarily want to be in the position to do that. <laughs> we don't necessarily want to be saving democracy. And each time that we do it, be it South Carolina for Biden, um, here with Warnock and, and Ossoff, each time we do it, we're also sparing this democracy a hard look at itself. We're sparing it those really hard lessons about what it's doing. And and why? And then can we also say, Alethea, that that while we're sparing democracy and saving democracy, democracy <laughs> is not saving us. And we have to be like critically clear about this fact that we delivered Warnock. But when you look at AJP, ARP, reconciliation, build back better, uh, make America great again, every frame that we asserted and pushed for. It was watered down. It was it was it was deeply diminished, and in many cases they were pitted against each other. And this is critically important because if we're thinking about what we delivered as Black voters, male and female, to the government, to the U.S., and what we asked for in return in the way of infrastructure, undergirding support, uh, nationalized programs, and resource, that didn't come back. And so when people talk about the voting base being disengaged or disenfranchised or apathetic, good God, how much energy did it take to uphold a Warnock win? And we sent you with one mission, but we couldn't deliver on voting rights. You pitted voting rights against uh, uh, Build Back Better. We couldn't deliver 
on the 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 uh, the American Rescue Plan. We saw what was lost in that process when you had us unbuckle or uncouple the infrastructure bill from the uh, uh, Build Back Better uh, reconciliation package. We saw time and time again that the decisions that were made on a national level by, by a, a, a government that was supposed to be ours. The, like when we put in context the value of the win of Warnock is that it gives us the tie-breaking vote with Vice President Harvest, but nobody accounted for cinema and mansion. We, we have to be honest mm -hmm. about the fact that we are not the governing republic and democracy that we want to be or aspire to be. We are exactly the bare knuckle brawl in the streets that our, our, our conservative counterparts desperately desire for us to be that warnock and 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 walker vote was far too close when we look at the last presidential far too close these things tell us that georgia functions as a canary in a cage for what we can build and grow for the potential but that potential only manifests when we have a unified force to grow with. And we do not have that base. And that terrifies me. I want to talk about um, proof of concept, right? What you just laid out, you both laid out, is proven pathways to a new politic, right? That can yield success in a clutch and could do more if it was resource, resourced more consistently, resourced longer term. Um, and we really paid attention to the wisdom and the genius present in Georgia instead of flying in uh, pollsters and others um, at the last minute. And I wonder when we talk about multiracial democracy and these statewide coalitions that are often black led, but black led does that mean it's all black, right? Mm -hmm. It's diverse. Coalition is not kumbaya. Right. What are some of the stress points and how are those navigated, right? What are some of the principles of practice for successfully building and maintaining, right, this broad based coalition? to be effective in the state. <clears throat> I think one of the things, excuse me, <clears throat> pardon me. One of the things that's contributed uh, to sort of our success and some of the success that we're seeing around the country is I think there's a clarity of mission and a clarity of your base. I would argue that, you know, one of the reasons why you know, for example, the mainstream Democratic Party struggles so mightily is because oftentimes by the time it gets to campaign time that the consulting class, um, but also candidates themselves forget divorce, forget who their base is uh, and who they need to super serve and who they need to have active and enthusiastic participation from in order to see the kind of victories that they seek, right? And that the successful sort of movement organizations that are doing this work do not often suffer under the same sort of delusions, right? That there's a clarity about who we are and who we're doing this for and what it is that we're trying to win. Um, I think that in those instances, it makes it easier to have, to bring, you know, a mi gente uh, and an Asian Americans advancing justice uh, and a Nigerian American Chamber of Commerce right, and an Association for Black Studies, right, and uh, labor to the table because folks are coming with clarity about their identities, their demographics, and what it is that they're trying to win. And again, seeing elections as an opportunity to, you know, elect accountable leaders, hopefully folks who come from our communities and who are accountable, like who want to make sure that there is no daylight uh, between the citizens and um, you know the 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 work that's being done in the state capital or in the national capital. 
Um, and we can come to these tables around elections um, because folks will continue to work. Like the minimum wage in Georgia is $5.15 an hour. The economic justice organizations are clear about that, that the federal minimum wage is $7.25 an hour. Americans haven't had raise in over a dozen years. It's almost been 20 years for Georgians. And so when the EJ groups come to the electoral table, they are clear that Having a Governor Abrams means that we can actually have a shot at getting a minimum wage that's above the federal minimum wage that like we can move beyond 515. Um, and, you know, so then, you know, you take that and you extrapolate that to the other groups that are at the table. I think that that is the thing that folks do not have to pretend that they don't have ideology. They don't have to pretend that they don't have goals outside of getting this person elected. Um, and that it is placed in it's appropriate context for the folks who are actually trying to win. That's why folks are really in their feelings, particularly um, successful democratically elected officials and their staffers, because folks just want us to go away after the work has been done and the campaign has been won. What'd you think this was for? Who did you think we were? Right. Of course, it turns into an advocacy campaign. Of course, we're coming to the Capitol. You didn't you, you thought we elected you because you were pretty. Like because we like the campaign theme song that you came out of the tour bus to. Absolutely not. That these groups had a vision that these voters, Georgia voters had a vision. American voters had a vision when they uh, uh, went sought to elect President Biden and student loan debt forgiveness was absolutely a part of it. You know what wasn't a part of it? Bailing out Silicon Valley Bank, right? And so again, it is a, it is electoral organizing as a tactic as a part of our broader community and issue organizing. And so the successful elections give us someone to negotiate with as we seek to raise the minimum wage, protect women's health, right? Um, protect our environment, you know, reduce carbon emissions, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. John, anything you'd like to contribute and how yeah, to I keep would, these coalitions in action? <clears throat> I would argue that this is where labor plays a critical role because labor is in so many ways that melting pot. It is that multi-racial uh, coalition. It is that multi-affinity group coalition already. It exists. If you think about the caucuses, if you think about the structures, if you think about who's at the table as members of your union, you don't get to choose who gets hired at the job, right? But you do get to fight for each one of them to have equal representation under the contract, under the guise of labor law. And so that table in many ways is set already inside of the context of labor and us being able to smartly partner with the ground-based organizations, allies, NGOs, and others who have specific interest in those silos allows us to grow a base. Like we, we saw it, like when you saw the voting rights work, when you saw the corporate accountability work here in Georgia, these were coalitions of the willing, but they were also kind of multiracial democracy at play, right? They, the, the messaging and the angles weren't just about black folks and or white folks. There was a lot of work done on immigration. There was a lot of work done with the Latinx community, the AAPI community, the LGBTQIA plus community. There was a lot of, of framing and messaging that studied and targeted multiple groups and affinities because labor understands that it doesn't win as a monolith and it doesn't win alone. While so many other frames or like large entities are trying to streamline and get to one message, one point, one voice, labor is trying to smartly uh, excavate the multiple identities and voices that exist and create one table. And so that I think is some of the power that labor brings into the mix. And then I'll just say, <clears throat> there's also a vehicle and a mechanism around accountability because of its inherent structure that benefits the movement overall with labor, but that has to come with checks and balances, right? Like there's there's no greater disappointment 
than everybody coming to the party and the folks who were in line in front of you got their plate and then they wrapped up the barbecue and they left with it. <laughs> Nobody else in line got a chance to eat, right? And so this, this is the thing. We have to make sure that whether it's labor or it's the party or it's any other kind of like affinity group that has a rising power base in this moment, that everybody makes that allegiance to one another, that we're in this fight, not just for our own grace and benefit, but for the democracy overall. And I think if we're smart about doing that, then we get to a place where all of us see benefit and that coalition that emerged in Georgia really does become a powerful prototype for how we we create democracy again. Because I don't I don't think we're saving democracy. I think democracy is lost. I think we have to recreate democracy and reimagine what it means to be in a civil society. Like everything I hear Insay saying is is right. And I'm more pessimistic. So it's like I I think folks intentionally know exactly what they're doing at every moment and that they are, yeah, they want you to elect them because uh, they feel pretty. And then once they are elected, they, they want you to just stare in the window, but please don't ever talk to me again. And like that, like the analogy I use all the time now, like my newest analogy for this is we are the ladder. The progressive community is the ladder and they need us to get on the roof. And so they climb us, <laughs> they invest in us, they make promises to us. And once they're on the, la on the roof, there's a helicopter there. <laughs> and that helicopter isn't run by us. And so they only needed us to get up the ladder onto the roof. But now there's this eerie question about whether or not we have the galvanized force and power to either pull them back off that roof or to protect and defend them from getting kicked off the roof by the folks that run the helicopter. And if we don't, then we begin to understand why in, in so many cycles of electoral politics, people get elected and then we say, but you promised us you were going to, and they said, but you got to understand, I mean, I mean, I got, these are all my constituents. I have to do, then they start paying. I'm the president of all of America. Oh, right, I'm the president of all of America. Yeah, I'm the governor of all of Georgia. But all of Georgia didn't elect you, sir. But, that, but that's, a, that's a story for another day. But it's that kind of difference between being an elected official, someone who serves the people in the, in the public interest, and a politician, someone who parses out the priorities based off of their electability. That becomes the thing that changes the landscape and why this multicultural coalition is so important because we have more levers to pull to hold those individuals accountable. Because if it's just me and Black Male Initiative Georgia, then they don't really think they need the brothers. Never in history have I seen a race where there were about six or seven people in it and the second runner up, like the, 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 the group that placed second in the race was dogged out as bad as we are. Black men, are historically and predictably the second highest voting base for progressive politics in this country, bar none, flat. It's true. Check the data. But we are treated as the scapegoat. And, you know, Insay alluded to this earlier. But so I'm smart enough to know that brothers are not enough to win it. We need the sisters. We need everybody else. We need a multicultural coalition that is going to hold the electeds accountable not just to get to office, but to get through office the legislation that causes a material condition change for us on the ground. Can I add that um, John is absolutely right about not only the disinformation, but sort of the, the limitations of um, the, the rhetoric that we have around American democracy. However, it I am super optimistic about the future of it. Um, and here's why. I mean, I would because we actually haven't ever really had a fully functioning democracy that was representative uh, and inclusive. And if we're being honest, if we look at the history of American sort of voting and, and voting participation and democratic participation, it is the story of right, uh, advancement and including more people and then like an immediate backlash, an immediate white lash and an attempt to, you know, go backwards. And so you, you know, the, you have the 1920 uh, with the passage of the 19th Amendment, um, or actually go back further, right? So we have 
white male property owners, right? And then that's expanded to include poor white men, right? And then that's expanded, you know, after decades, a century of organizing to include women, et cetera. Um, it would take another 45 years of organizing after the 19th Amendment to include women of color with the Voting Rights Act and, and Black folks with the Voting Rights Act of 1965, on and on and on. And so, I would argue that, you know, while people are like bemoaning the end of like a functioning democracy, that I am saying that we are in fact in trying to birth it for the first time ever. Uh, and that these prototypes did not serve us. They were stooped steeped like in the racist, sexist, classist politics of the day and that the uneasiness that people are witnessing and experiencing is in fact the birth of the thing that we've been saying we wanted for centuries. I can rock with that. <laughs> I can rock with Listen, it helps me get out of bed. Join me in my delusion. <laughs> that's the reimagining is right that's, that's the fire no I I, I I I also happen to uh, like in fact believe that right that um I mean and, and part of it is looking at uh the U.S. Uh, electoral and political history in a global context right and so if you think about I mean to go back to South Africa from a previous conversation that we were having when we were getting prepared right that the first free and fair elections were in 1994 Yep. Right. And so, yeah, there are challenges. Yeah. Like uh, parties figuring out how to engage people like, um, yeah, having, you know, candidates who have identities um, that folks are not used to seeing in leadership. But right? it's I mean, no, America has never had a black woman um, executive or a black woman governor. And Georgia was poised to give America its first. Uh, but there are several of our institutions institutions that still struggle with gendered leadership uh, and you know from churches mosques synagogues universities uh, corporations right that while we can agree that gender is not a predictor of how effective a leader is that we still haven't had a black woman president um, and that you know again that there are there's a lot of work to be done in institutions that are just trying to get to the place where the rhetoric around democracy and the rhetoric around inclusion and participation is meeting our reality and folks are figuring it out and it's hard um but it is worth it and like again that is what we are experimenting with and advancing towards it has never been what we have had It is an idea that inspires millions to bring it into life and to make it more a reality. And we constantly have to battle against a small elite group who believes they have to protect it from the rest of us, right? Who believe that they, in fact, are the creators of it, <laughs> it's their birthright, and that they're the only ones who really know, right, how to wield it despite a time and again, history teaching them otherwise. Uh, they keep ignoring those lessons of history and it's really important for us to uh, keep watering those flowers, rejuvenating ourselves and dreaming different dreams that are really grounded in knowledge of the past, but also reaches towards a new, a new future. So this is a forum where we want to give you and all, all the colleagues you represent your flowers now for being the incredibly brilliant strategist. I think to close out this segment, I'm wondering if you can each share with us uh, a tool, a tactic, something concrete that gives you um, a taste of what the future is, right? Or could turn, um, could help turn the tide. 
honestly, I think it's our relationships. And I know that that sounds corny. I'm listening to myself and I'm kind of annoyed with myself and it's absolutely freaking true. Um, you know, I think about my transition out of leadership at the New Georgia Project. I think about like the, um, the awesomeness and the beauty of what we built in Georgia. And I also think about the attacks that came, not only from white Christian nationalists who were external to our organizing, but within our organization. And when I, like how grateful I am for John's friendship, right? That I don't ever have to strategize in a vacuum. I don't ever have to develop a campaign plan in a silo. And that while people are, again, there's the rhetoric around coalition, like it is our secret sauce, right? There's so much of what we know and understand about the civil rights movement, women's rights movement, et cetera, up to this point have been focused focused on the heroics of individual leaders. And we never really got to hear and understand the stories about the infrastructure that was built and the organizers and advocates and folks behind the scenes who helped sort of sustain the energy of a particular movement. That when personal attacks come at individual leaders, when it's just focused on an individual leader, that effort can dissipate because folks have attributed whatever moral failings uh, or whatever the narrative is to the movement itself, right? And that the idea is that as they attack us as individuals that we, this work continues, it's super real, number one. Number two, it, when we say multiracial democracy, when we say that Georgia is going to be the first state in the deep South with the white minority, that still is only with African Americans and Black Georgians, so, so Africans, Caribbeans, Afro Latinos, and Black Americans, um, with like 38, 39, almost 40% of the population. So what gets us to 51 is Latinos and Asian Americans in a real way, right? That the, And so our relationships are, they matter. Why? And and that's why at the New Georgia Project, I can lead research efforts that help us understand that in our model, there's no such that the label Asian American voter is useless for us that our Indian American auntie votes very differently and occupies a different spot on the ideological spectrum than our Chinese uncle. And that as a black led voting rights organization investing in that kind of research because we have legitimate partners and because we intend to build together over the long term is super important. So now that we've not only dispensed with a label that is useless for our campaigns and our organizing, but we've set on a path of understanding how to talk to voters and how to move voters and how to move people to action in a broad diversity of communities. And we are seen as credible actors and credible leaders in a number of spaces because of our relationships, because it, it doesn't just form around an election or form around Cop City and like an attempt to roll back the rights, destroy the environment and use our tax dollars to occupy us in our communities, right? And so, yes, it sounds corny and it is very, very real. I love it. I'm gonna stay on the corner train with you. So, you know, my favorite quote of all time is, if in order to overcome my oppressor, I have to become like my oppressor, then no matter the outcomes, we've already lost. And I take that to heart. Like I that I really live by that. Like we different, y'all. We that, that's the secret to the sauce. We're gonna share a little sauce with y'all. You know, Dr. King said that you, you know, hate can never drive out hate. Only love can do that. That darkness could never drive out darkness. Only light can do that. And so it, it is exactly the frame that Ente lifted up. Our, our secret is love. Our secret is that beloved community that quite frankly exists in a different space. We resonate a, 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 at a different frequency. We are happy to see each other. We are proud to lift each other's up. We don't say each other's name. We sing each other's name. 
because there is love and honor and hope in that. And what's so dope about it is when you see us constantly get knocked down, when you see victory that is followed by failure and defeat, when you see moments that are so dark, even when you think about this conversation, and I said, I'm more pessimistic than that. And our sister Inse came back right behind me and lifted up that moment. See, that's the thing that folks don't get about our secret sauce. Our secret sauce is love because love fuels will. And it is the will of the people that is stronger than any other bond that exists. And that is solely because we have something to fight for. In my darkest moments, I know that I can ring her phone. I know that our amen corner is growing stronger while our enemies grow weaker. And here's the slick thing about it. As our enemies grow weaker, guess what we give them? We nourish them with love too. We nourish them with comfort too. That is the amazing thing about being able to be in this space and of this entity. Because I know that I don't wish ill on anyone. I wish grace, love, forgiveness, peace, growth, tolerance, understanding, and most importantly, love. Because that carries us through those dark moments and will be the guiding light to grow us. I love Little sauce. Can I add one more thing? Please, always. I think it's organization. Um, organizing, I think that in my... And so when we are thinking about like what organizations need to do, but also how individuals can show up in this particular moment and, and prepare us for what we need to win um, in the road ahead. I am by all definitions, like an introvert and a loner, like I like my things, uh, but I definitely believe in organizing. I think that each of us should have a political home. I think that, um, and I think that that is part of, um, you know, our scripts are part of our organizing when we're out registering voters. Like you don't register 700,000 um, people of color uh, in 159 counties at a time where you're being attacked just for its own sake, right? Like the idea is that we were in coalitions and we were in communities, um, that we had organization, that there were 18 offices across the state state of Georgia, hundreds of staff, that staff that grew to thousands um, by election day. Um, and that whenever, when our, in our millions of face-to-face -face conversations with Georgians each year, telling people like, it doesn't have to be the new Georgia project, but we encourage people to find their political home. Um, that, you know, I'm, I'm a southerner. And uh, so, you know, I could be forgiven for my um, overuse of church and religious uh, metaphors, but I think about the Georgia Mass Choir um, and their ability to hold powerful notes for such a long time. And a lot of it has to do with each individual vocalist doing what they can, when they can, right? And so when an individual vocalist like can't make it to choir rehearsal because of competing personal or professional obligations, you know the choir rehearsal is still happening. And that you know that when each individual vocalist is holding their own note, uh, that it goes longer and more powerful and louder than what I could do as an individual. There are people who are organizing right now in organizations who care about the things that you care about, who share your values. And so us, again, even when we are recruiting for a new Georgia project membership, uh, that it might not be the most appropriate home, or we may not have an office nearby in your community, or you have told us that like you absolutely 100% care about reproductive justice, the attacks on reproductive justice, the attacks on um, privacy. And so of course, we're going to connect you with our, sis our siblings over at Sister Song, um, like a leading national reproductive rights organization. And so I think that's it, like that we love ourselves, we love our families, we love our communities, and that's a renewable resource that we will continue to be able to tap into to power our campaigns and power our 
our movements and that we have organization that is not reliant on some individual like messiah messianic figure or some individual superhero or person with all the right words and the six button suit and the hard bottom shoes uh that looks like what a leader is supposed to look like for you that we don't have to rely on individual heroics in order to keep the sustain the energy that our campaigns need Woo! the amen corner is woo, alive and rocking this morning you're both embodying and really bringing the message of what a soul-driven strategy looks like <laughs> sounds like how you build it it's not an easy path but it is a path to victory and is a path that saves the soul of a nation and saves the soul of democracy and the dreams of many around the globe. Thank you for really showing us the beauty and the spirit and the generosity and the universality of what black led grassroots genius is all about. With that, we're going to end the recorded session of this um, 